Hello, everyone. I'm Laura Greiner, your host for today's Swine It podcast. And with me today, I have Dr. Jim Lowe, who's an associate professor in the College of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Illinois. Jim, how are you doing today? I am fantastic, Laura. Good to see you. It's good to see you as well. Hey, for our audience who may not be familiar with your background, would you mind just sharing a little bit about yourself and where you've come from so that we can have our conversation today? I would uh, be happy to, Laura. So uh, as you said, I'm on faculty now, and it probably means that I'm just washed up. But uh, I think by habit, uh, I'm a pig farmer, and by training, I'm a pig veterinarian. But uh, spent really a long time now um, focused kind of on the business side and the data side and research side has all been uh, infectious disease. So we still do some of that, but um, around in the cattle world a little bit. Uh, so partnering in a group there that does some cattle consulting and uh, do some human disease work, uh, transmission work. So kind of um, probably the uh, master of no trade, but uh, the jack of all trades and master of none. So that's, um, that's where I'm at. And so it's really fun to be here today. Enjoy the chance. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, I'm excited to visit with you. And, you know, as you mentioned, you've worked a lot with different infectious diseases. And over the course of the years that we've known each other, you've bounced between flu and, of course, various pig diseases. And as you mentioned, you've worked in the cattle side as well. And I've always found it interesting because it, we'd have a lot of those conversations where we'd be like, hey, the cattle guys are doing this. We should be thinking about it. And so where are they at today that there might be something from the pork industry side that we should be thinking about? Yeah, I think, Laura, it's um, the similarities are a whole lot greater than the differences, right? I mean, and I think that's the hard people are like, oh, you're a pig guy. You can't do this cattle thing. Well, it's the same business, right? I mean, we smash up corn and make muscle. Now, cattle guys, we sell fat and muscle and pig guys, we just sell muscle. But it's it's the end of the day. I mean, it's it's kind of the same business. So the breeding herd still drives the show. And so as I look at that, right, I think the biggest difference, if I look at the three big proteins, chicken and, and pork and beef, right, and how those things are positioned in the market, uh, the chicken guys have obviously carved out the bottom, low cost, flavor vehicle, protein, cheap protein source and, and have done miraculous at that and really gotten good at fabrication, right? So they take something that actually has no taste and impart taste on it with product or put a chicken nugget or whatever it is. It's really a nice fabrication, really good business story there. The beef guys have gone the other direction, right? And said, we're really going to go create a premium product and try to continue to, to price it that way. And you see certified Angus beef and, you know, those efforts and you go around the globe. I think we you know, both had a chance to go all over the place, right? And American beef is on the table there. But it's the, again, it's the middle meats. It's the really high value rib in particular, um, that. And so the other thing that's really different about beef and chicken compared to pork is their reliance on retail or excuse me, on food service and not just retail. So, right, we sell a lot of bacon, uh, but um, in the, 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 and I will generically use the term, the McDonald's of the world, right? I mean, if you, the world's largest fast food company, so, right? They buy a tremendous amount of bacon and they buy a lot of sausage, but that's not the evening meal or the noon meal, right? They sell hamburgers and chicken. And so as we look at those, right, those guys are at a little different um facing of understanding what's happening what's coming where's the pressure coming from uh on the consumer side and i think that's you know as i've spent some time now and had a chance and we do a bit of teaching now really in the business space in this master's program we're doing and so how do we think about the supply chain and that's been an interesting bit to think about um and what are they doing and and so if you're just going to kind of look at the big ticket items right um, I think one, uh, all of the meat businesses don't understand our customer very well, <laughs> even if we're vertically integrated, right? We don't really understand how the grocery works and how do they create value. And that's been interesting to think about, but in, I think we think we know because we're customers of the grocery store, we're customers of the restaurant, but how those businesses work, right? That's a bit different. And so the beef and chicken guys are really into that, but as you get tight not you know because of their dependence on that market they're they're that's their customer but what's really been interesting is right they're also at the point of the spear on feeling pressure from consumer groups or activist groups whatever you want to call them so obviously pig guys we've got a lot of flack over sow housing and you know the chicken guys are catching flack over 
over um, cage free and all that, you know, free range hens and whatever else. Right. But the beef guys have kind of avoided that in a lot of respects. Um Except now there's a lot of questions really being asked about antibiotic use. And obviously that's been an issue, right? We've got funding Iowa State's hosting the, the um, Niamry group, the antibiotic use group. And so that's an industry-wide approach. So there's there's been a lot of commotion in that space. But I think as our group has started doing some more work on the beef side and in that space and working through the packers and into retail, Boy, that's uh, that's coming hard and fast. And so um, we're looking at that saying they're looking at us saying now saying for the beef we bought today, how many antibiotic, how many milligrams of these classes of antibiotics were used per kilogram of meat you sold? me? And that's been led by the chicken guys because they can do that because it's a house and it's a contained plant and right. That's a really tightly contained system. And so as the beef guys are being asked that question, mm, uh, mm, uh, um, um, some, yeah, we use some. Mm -hmm. So I think those are right. Those are kind of the things that we're looking at saying, and obviously we've had changes in the law and everything else, but I think as I look at where we're coming today, it's this idea of, how is the consumer going to influence what we do on the farm? And what role, therefore, does the farm actually supply play in supplying food? And where does that fit? What does that look like? What are those macro trends? And I, this antibiotic thing has been um, scary and um, interesting to interesting. Um, to look at all at the same time, right? It's like watching a train wreck. I'm curious, are they actually giving levels? So for example, if they ask how much of septifer has been used, um, would they be setting a certain standard saying, we don't want any more than so many milligrams per kilograms in that meat ever, ever given? And we understand there's withdrawals, but are they doing that at this point or are they just wanting documentation? They don't know what they want which is scary, right? And so we, we just wanna know. And I think that's been the key message that, and we can't tell them often what they should know. So the request today is basically, if you look at most of the spots we've been at, I think San Francisco is probably the most progressive spot with this. And I don't mean politically, I mean, they are way ahead of the curve on this. So San Francisco passed a law several years ago that said, uh, you thou shall report, Mr. Grocer, Mr. Whoever, how many milligrams of all these seven or nine classes of antibiotics have been used? So how much cephalosporin, how much macrolide, how much aminoglycoside, right? By drug class. Milligrams of use per kilogram of meat that showed up in the store today. And so the, the groceries there in particular are feeling the heat. And they've, you know, they've tried to work through it and said, oh, we'll, we'll get to that. And now they're saying, no, no, there's no more getting to it. We're going to fine you if you don't get this done. And so, right, you're seeing that. And certainly there are other large food service organizations starting to ask those questions. <laughs> and retail organizations starting to ask those questions. And there's been a lot of quotes. Should it be the number of doses? Should it be this? Should it be that? And obviously, when you start measuring milligrams per kilogram, that's a challenge because, right, if I give... Um, Draxin, so lathromycin, that's an extended duration antibiotic. So we give the dose once. And if I'm giving uh, maybe a better example is ceftiofor, there's two, basically three forms of ceftiofor, right? So I can give exceed, which is an extended duration. So I give it once and it hangs out for a long time, or I have to give three doses. And so none of those questions are really being asked around uh, what are we doing with antimicrobial resistance? They're really saying more use is bad. And I think that's the generally assumed approach. I don't know if we know that. Like, I'm not sure the science is that clear. <laughs> but the assumption they're working off is more is bad. So they're just saying, listen, we just want to know what the baseline values are. You tell us what you've done. And 
thank goodness nobody's saying today in that steak or in that pork chop. They're merely saying at a macro level, what's your supply chain using? And, and so that's a challenge, right? We get the same conversations going to happen around carbon use. But I, I think those, and they're fascinating questions to me, but it says as producers, our customer's customer is going to be forced to do some things. Now, does it have value? probably doesn't have intrinsic value that you're going to pay me more for my pig or you're going to pay me more for my steer. But it certainly looks like it's going to be a real market access piece. And so the first that adopted, it's a little bit like created sow housing, right? The first, we were getting a premium on the first guys that put in created sow housing. It's Proposition 12. It's all those conversations. The first adopter is going to make some money. But that's pretty short-lived. And then it's going to be, hey, here this comes. And so... The challenges, which means opportunities for us, are really around what are we going to do with data? Who's going to win the data battle? In the pig world, how are we going to capture that? Feelot world, it's pretty easy. We take all those sick cattle to a treatment area and we treat them. And because they're in different lots and different pens, and those pens have different owners often, because that's how the system was built, we build the drug back to the individual lot as it's given. So our treatment records in the cattle world are fantastic. So we've got that granularity in the feedlot world. Now, we don't have anything before they show up in the feedlot. I mean, we have no earthly idea what happened. So there's a big gap there, right? Because of the way the industry works, we've traded those cattle multiple times. You certainly are seeing people getting, thinking about that. And we can talk about really where Walmart's at and trying to move that forward. But there's the data bit that works on the cattle side. As I look at it on the pig side, boy, we're... A lot of that's on paper. And we may not actually be recording how many milliliters went to that pig. And we've got, uh, we put some bottles in the barn. But did we get an inventory back? And yes, we know how many bottles the system bought. And it appears today that that may be adequate. Like, ah, we just wondered how much you bought. But, you know, it's the... Uh, it's the mission creep thing. Once they know that, they're going to actually force us to verify that. So I think, you know, as a as veterinarians are thinking about it or really producers are sitting there thinking about it saying, okay, what am I going to have to do to my data systems that create that transparency? And that's a cost. And there's no flat out, we're going to pay for that. So then the question becomes, how do I use that change that's going to be forced down my throat? We can talk about it all the polite. Somebody's going to do this. I don't know. We can, Thou shall like it at some point, right? And so um, just don't choke. Just swallow swallow gracefully. Um, and so then the bit comes on the backside. How do I turn that into something that's got real value with us? And so how do I use that treatment data better? How do I create different, different metrics out of that internally to really improve my efficiency in my system? Because that's we're going to get the cost borne on us one way. Yeah, I think that's a novel way to look at it is is rather than just say, well, it's something I have to do. Obviously, every time we do these things, those those records provide us information. And again, while it might be some back information, um, you know, I talked to somebody this last week, we were talking about real time monitoring. And so if, if some of the software starts to pick up and that gets entered real time and, and the feedback comes back um, as well as keeping track of inventory, right, then we start to see that progress. and really allowing producers to take that technology and that information and move it forward and become a useful piece rather than just a, I'm checking a box must do type of, of approach. Um, I think what still concerns me too, though, is okay, so we're going into California and we're we're taking these records of, okay, well, here's, here's how much milligram per kilogram of antibiotic came through product. They're going to take that number and they're going to tell the consumer, right? And you you started down that path. The consumer doesn't know what that means. They have no clue that this product might require more milligrams from a from an active level versus this one to even get a response. And so, how do we maybe start thinking about how to tell that story, right? Because I think that we're going to have to be ready for that piece. That's that's the next step. I'm stumbling here because I don't, A, know how to tell the story. B, I'm not convinced the consumer does care. 
And I don't, I, please, I don't understand the grocery business, but the grocery business is about selling product. They're selling SKUs. It just happens to be something you can eat, right? It's no different in any respect than the clothing business. And you're like, oh, the clothing business isn't a perishable. Mm -mm, no, it is because you got a season and you got to get rid of it. And so, yes, it's a little less perishable than a chunk of meat, but it's probably not any less perishable than potato chips that got all these preservatives on it that are good for two and a half years or whatever, right? I mean, some of the box goods today, you look at the date and you're like, whew, still good. <laughs> and so, but that is right. It's an, ex it's a, they're selling, um, they're selling a skew. They're selling a product and a consumer is buying a product and it just happens to be consumable, right? And so I think there's a, there's that discussion around um, how does that work? And so does the consumer really care? Does the consumer want to know that much? And I think there's some indications that might not be true, right? We put all these food labeling things on packages. And yes, there's a segment of the consumer that really wants to know what's on the food label. But the vast majority of consumers like, are like, I don't know. I want to eat this today. I'm going to eat it. I don't want to know. Right. And so will that change over time? It could. And certainly each generation has a different buy, set of buying preferences. But I think like with most things, food, it becomes commoditized. You know, right. I can even me just think about like we ate those um, mashed potatoes in a bag that you can heat up with hot water. And in three minutes you got or two minutes, you got a bag of potatoes. Right. A, because they're pretty good, but B, they're super handy, right? If we've been traveling or it's just the two of us, hey, that's easy to dump out. We can have potatoes ready to go. Well, whether you buy those originally, right, there's whatever X brand and you can only buy them at the one spot. And they were kind of fancy. Well, heck, you can buy them at all these now and whatever the Aldi brand is. It's become commoditized. We don't ask. I don't know. It's like a bag of potatoes. It's basically the same as the expensive ones. And so maybe we're the odd consumer, but... When I go in all these, I see a lot of young people in there shopping. And so I think that there's still that. So I think we have to be careful of saying, do we really need, what is our customer's business? What's our customer's customer's business? Right now for integrated, it's our customer's business, but what do they value? And I think this whole uh, antibiotic journey, we're going to get there with carbon footprint. We're going to get there with blah, blah, just it's going to get tacked on. How do we go really learn our customer's business better to understand how they create value and their source all the value proposition for them? I, I don't know, but it would not shock me if we walked into a retailer and said, how do we educate the consumer as antibiotic use? And they looked at us and said, why would you do that? We don't care. So they're not going to care. What, you know, right? I mean, and... Uh, is there a segment of customers that are going to care? Absolutely. There's always a segment of customers that are going to care. But I, I, I don't know. So don't, I'm not trying to say we shouldn't do that. I'm saying I think we need to go ask a lot of questions. Well, I think it's very fair, especially right now when we think about the way food prices have gone up, fuel prices, everything is creeping up. Most consumer today, they, they just want something that they can afford. And, and yes, they want to ensure that there's, safe product for their family, but their version of safe is certainly different than other populations. So I, I agree, Jim. I think that still our majority of our customers' customers are going to be those that are looking for economical products that they can feed their family. Um, but it, it's still something that sits on your mind, right? And so you mentioned even CO2, and I'm, I'm going to venture down that path just a little bit on you. Where do you see that one currently? in the cattle industry and how do you see that creeping into the pig industry? I, I think, and I, you, I don't know if you saw, the SEC proposed this rule, several of the Securities and Exchange Commission, right? That trade, publicly traded companies and their suppliers are going to have to report carbon emission in their supply chain. So if that rule comes to be, and obviously it's a long ways from coming to be, that kind of thing is really going to throw a loop in the, in the process. So um, where is it going to happen? Um, 
the cattle boys are obviously square in the crosshairs because it's what three X the amount of carbon to produce a pound of beef as it is to produce a pound of pork and, you know, like 20% more, 30% more to produce a pound of pork than it is a pound of chicken. But, you know, if you look at this, you see some of the crazy stuff happening. We've got a customer base on the beef side that a client, a feed jar that has been in the natural space a long time. And so, Natural means uh, no antibiotics, no uh, no hormones, so no TBA implant in their ear. And so um, they've been in that space, have been very successful in that space. Their performance is significantly worse, i.e. using significantly more carbon because their feed efficiencies are worse. They're... So if you look at it on a dry matter basis, we'd say on a seven weight steer showing up, you ought to be in this, you know, seven range or six, six, six range on feed conversion on a dry matter basis, right? In a pig, we're saying two and a half. So you're at a two and a half to one already disadvantage, right? Feeding him corn and soybean or feeding him corn and a little bit of roughage. There's the grass fed movement today. And so these guys are putting in grass space, right? Oh, well, there's opportunity to make money feeding grass fed cattle. And so that means they're going to put cattle in the feedlot and they're going to feed them 95% roughage, just enough grain to add protein. They're expecting feed conversions on the cattle like 16 to 1 on a dry matter basis. So two and a half times worse than where they're at with natural cattle, right? Or compared to high quality or compared to, you know, really normal TBA type implanted conventional cattle, I guess is the word I'm looking for. And so I find all those things really contradictory, right? That the people that want to buy the grass fed are the same customer who's worried about carbon emissions is the same one who's worried about welfare. And we know if, I mean, kind of my rule has always been death is bad welfare. That's kind of like, I mean, I don't mean to make it complicated, but like, okay, we can have all these ob these subjective things, but like if you dead, if they're dead, like that must be bad. Like, I don't want that for me, for them, for whoever, right? There's probably suffering that occurred before they die. And so if you look at that, you know, those natural cattle, you know, their mortality is not quite double what the conventional cattle are. Again, we can't treat them. If we treat them, you lose the value. You've got all this money tied up, right? So it's a human decision. They don't get treated. But again, we've got very practically, we've got, I think, objectively worse welfare. We've got certainly more carbon emissions. We're using a lot more land to produce that same amount of muscle. And so I think those are the conundrums we get into. We're not there on the pig side. I think we as a pig industry are a bit lost on what we're going to be when we grow up. Are we going to be the chicken boys and make flavorless, uh, a flavor vehicle because it has no flavor and we're going to impart it and do a heavy fabrication? which is where we made money. Our fabrication is called bacon, right? But we're not making money on the pork chop anymore. We're making it and we're making the bacon and your life is good, right? Or are we going to go down the beef route and say, no, 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 we're going to really produce a super high quality product and we're going to live off the rib. And I'm going to sell a $22 a pound or $36 a pound premium ribeye and make that happen. And so I think, right, and there's probably niches for all of that, but certainly if you're going to go down the, the flavor vehicle model, heavy fabrication, there's probably less uh, requirement to do some of these things compared to if I'm going to be in the premium space and get paid for that stuff. And so I, those are the, this is, I keep saying, right, well, it's got to slow down. This thing's got to quit changing, but now, I started with pigs and a huts, like as a practitioner. So, <laughs> this is a little different than twelve thousand South Farm, right? You're like, oh, it's a little different than a shed out here. But, um, but I think this thing is going to continue to change, and that's the exciting spot to be. But I think as leaders in the industry, those that figure out this customer's customer solution, really the retailer, food service. What are their problems and how do we add value to them? Those are the ones that are going to win. And the beef guys are trudging down that path, kicking and screaming, but having to figure that out pretty quick. Well, that's actually very interesting, Jim. And as I kind of see our time is wrapping up a little bit here. So maybe give our audience just a couple of key takeaways from today that you'd like for them to keep in their mind or 
even think about how they're going to move forward in, in their own space. Yeah, I think we think about that we're making food when we grow animals. And our customer is a live animal producer. The packer thinks they're making food. And their customer, the retailer, thinks they're making a product, or making a skew. And so there's this transformation process, right, that we have to think about in what's going on. And um, this stuff is not going away. Uh, more reporting, more traceability, more visibility in the system. And he who figures it out and can figure out how to make their own business better, business better with it and not just at a cost of their system is going to win. And there is tremendous opportunity, but the industry 10 years from now isn't going to look anything like it looks today. And I, I, I think we're going to go through another one of these big shakes and it's going to look different again. Very good. That's good advice. So as we wrap up, we normally like to ask our guest speaker a couple of questions. Um, the first one I'm going to ask you is, what is your favorite swine resource? So my favorite resource are my colleagues. And so I think, right, and that's probably because I'm old and don't have any hair and know a lot of people now, but I think it's all those relationships that are super valuable. And so if I was going to go, if I was a youngster and um, was going to say, ah, how do you build the resources around you? I think it's really, how do you find people that probably get a little bit of gray hair or not just same age as you, but around the block and really build relationships with those people to help you mentor and understand and the broader that base. And I would encourage that to be not people who look like you. I mean, if you're a veterinarian, you might make friends with nutritionists or geneticist. Um, and the same goes the other way. And I think that's a critical, that's the critical resource that you can build as a person. And I think that's what helps me, right? I'm again, I'm the master of none, but the jack of all trades. And I think it's being broad in those subjects. It's got a lot of value for it. It's had a lot of value for me. Very good. How about, um, something that's not related to pigs? Is there a resource that you might recommend to the group? Yes. I am reading a book called the secret life of groceries. And I got turned on to that uh, by Janet Bernard's um, uh, weekly email. And so she does a blog post every week. And I would encourage everybody to subscribe to that. But this it's a, it's a fascinating deal. She really forces you to think in the secret life of groceries is tearing apart how uh, the supply chain looks. Um, so it's a fascinating bit of, of digging into those. And so there's a bunch of other stuff I've been reading in the supply chain space, but this is, um, it's, it's quite an interesting bit. Uh, and Janet is absolutely fantastic. So, uh, she will challenge your thinking. She will say some things that, uh, you may not agree with. Uh, um, that's my style. Um, and so, um, I like it, but, uh, I'd encourage everybody to subscribe to that, her, um, her blog post as well, because, uh, I think that's really a nice way to get some different ideas and where you've been at. So the last question we like to ask really is around, if you can think about someone in your life that, that you view as successful, what key trait or quality do they possess that has allowed them to be successful? I've been really fortunate. I've been around a lot of super successful people. Um, but if I look across all of them, they are they they are willing to fail and they are willing to fail spectacularly but they were also brilliant at fixing it and so i don't want to say they're risk takers i mean they, people might call them risk takers but they were willing to go do things and fail and then learn from that failure and so the idea right this whole thing around lean startups and how do you fail fast I think great entrepreneurs have always been that way. I'm going to try it. If it doesn't work, that's okay. Um, and so not having the brilliant plan, just knowing which direction we're going to go and try it and have at it. And if it works, great. If it doesn't, we'll fix it. And I think every successful person I've been around, that's been their approach. And um, again, I've been lucky. That's uh, to have people encourage me and push me and do those things. But that's, that's what, I, what I've experienced. I think that's an interesting trait. I can think of a handful of people that in my life, I would say the same thing. And that is a trait they possess. So that's actually very, very 
good insight. That's one I haven't heard recently. So, Jim, we do want to thank you for your time. I know uh, you're a very busy person. Uh, for our audience, just to recap, this is Dr. Jim Lowe, who's an associate professor at the University of Illinois in the College of Veterinary Medicine. Jim, thank you so much for your time today. Thanks for the opportunity, Laura. Imagine if, with a few key concepts, you could have the potential to create a massive positive impact by bringing from hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars for swine producers. Join us on this small group and go to the next level of swine nutrition on this seven week long elite online training in applied swine nutrition and feeding by myself and my world class invited speakers. Additionally, you enjoy an exclusive community to exchange ideas. Go now to www.eliteswinenutritionist.com.